Well, a very good Sunday morning to you. I'm thrilled that you're joining us. It always means a lot to me when I see people who take their faith seriously enough to actually invest part of their day into the study of God's Word. And so I'm really glad you're joining us for this time. By the way, uh, you are watching online, whether it's uh, live or whether it's on demand later. Um, just in case you haven't heard yet, our facility is open for in-person gathering. We've had great experiences here. If you haven't had that opportunity yet, you can log online and register for that. And uh, of course, we're thrilled you are where you are. We're also thrilled when you come here. So we hope that you are able to join us soon. We're starting a, a series uh, today in um, Acts. Uh, we're going to study the book of Acts. And I'm going to start right in the first chapter. We're going to try to take about a chapter a week. And uh, so it begins like this. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized you with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you going to, at this time, restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. So a fair question to ask is, why would we study the book of Acts? And the Gospels kind of tell us the story of what Jesus did with his disciples, the book of Acts tells the story of what Jesus did through his disciples. Um, what it's telling us is that just to observe what Jesus did is kind of an incomplete faith journey, that, that there's a way for us to participate in this adventure of faith. So Luke also wrote the Gospel of Luke. So he's responsible for writing two books of the New Testament. And the Gospel ends with the resurrection, the book of Acts picks up where that gospel left off. So let's start by uh, answering a couple questions about who Luke is. You know, who was this person that's writing two books of the New Testament? We know he was a very well-educated uh, Greek. We know that he was a physician, a doctor. In fact, uh, he was Paul, the Apostle Paul's personal physician. He was likely a Gentile. Uh, in the book of Colossians, uh, the Apostle Paul lists a group of people that were with him, and he identifies the people who were with him who were Jewish in, in their genealogy, and then he identified those who were not Jewish, and Luke is listed in that list. He also, uh, we know he's, he, he brings a very educated and scientific mind to the research that he does and to the reporting that he gives. He uses some technical terms sometimes that you might be more likely to hear a doctor use than uh, a person who hasn't had that education. And we know that Luke met the Apostle Paul and became a, a constant traveling companion of the Apostle Paul. And you can actually tell when in history this occurs if you're reading through the book of Acts. Up until chapter 16, the, the, uh, uh, Luke always refers to they and them. But in chapter 16, he moves to we. So you can actually see where in the book that uh, Luke kind of enters the story in his relationship with the Apostle Paul. And, the, and then the question also is, so why would he write two volumes instead of just one volume? Well, Christians were actually under significant attack, a lot of very real persecution. Uh, they, they were being killed 
for their faith. And Luke knew that eventually there would be no more living witnesses of the things that Jesus had said and the things that Jesus had done. And so he wanted there to be an authentic resource that would actually outlive the eyewitnesses. He wanted people to know what Jesus had done, but he also wanted them to know how the church started and what the church did. So he also wanted to correct some misunderstandings. And one of those big misunderstandings has to do with the kingdom of God. In fact, you notice when I read the passage in, in Acts chapter 1, uh, Jesus tells them to wait and that God's going to release his gift, the promised Holy Spirit to them. And their first question is, is this the time you're going to restore the kingdom? Their concept of kingdom is that it would be a political revolution or a military conquest. And uh, the concept of the kingdom of God is actually something radically different than that. And so the apostle Paul understood that and he kind of educated Luke in this. And so Luke wants to make sure that people don't misunderstand. The kingdom of God is not a political movement. The kingdom of God is not a military conquest. The kingdom of God expands when God's people go where God's spirit directs them and they do what God's spirit tells them to do. That's how God's kingdom expands. God's people are not simply called to go to church. God's people are called to be the church wherever they go. That's actually quite a different thing. That's why we're going to study the book of Acts. So we're not just looking for historical data when we go through here. History is good, and we should know the history of our faith. But we're not just looking for historical facts. We're looking for patterns. And this is a very important way to think about how we grow and how we learn our faith. You see, our goal in our faith is not just to imitate style and personalities of others. Rather, it's to identify patterns that inform us how to live out our faith. So we're not just trying to reenact some tradition that's been handed down to us. We want to learn how to depend on God in challenging moments. And this is what we see the church do in the book of Acts over and over again. So how can we learn to do that? We must learn how to act in a moment, not just reenact someone else's moment. This is why the book of Acts is so powerful and so helpful to us. Uh, of course, we don't have any uh, video or audio of anything that occurred in the ancient world or the events that Luke refers to in his gospel or in the book of Acts. And, uh, and in some ways, I'm actually kind of glad about that. Uh, can you imagine what it would be like if, if people had seen actual video and audio footage of the Apostle Peter, the Apostle Paul, there would be a lot of people who were mimicking them and imitating them rather than learning to live in the life that Jesus was flowing through them. It's a very different thing. We're not called to imitate people. We're called to, we're called to live in the life of Christ. And this is something quite uh, different. And so I'd like us to think about that just a little bit. Um, we, we need to learn how to live out our faith with our voice, in our culture, through our challenges, with our family. We're not just here to, to reenact someone else's experience. So Jesus spent 40 days following his resurrection with his closest followers. And his main focus, we're told in those opening verses of the very first chapter, his main focus is on the kingdom of God. This is what he keeps talking about. And once again, that's why Luke wanted to make sure people didn't misunderstand this. Any vision or dream that is something other than the kingdom of God is always smaller than the kingdom of God. Sometimes human comes, humans come up with grand schemes and big plans and bold visions, but there will never be anything an individual comes up with that is greater in terms of depth or capacity or expansion than the kingdom of God itself. And so the book of Acts helps us to learn how to think in terms of being kingdom people, not just our kingdom people, our own kingdom. 
And what we want to learn how to do is to yield control to God because the tendency is when we are trying to build our own kingdoms is we want to take control. But people who are part of the kingdom of God actually look for ways to yield control to God. And that requires us to ask a very simple question. What is God doing in this moment? How can I partner with him? That's a very different way to approach. If you don't allow God to rule in your heart, you will never actually see him rule in your world. This is an internal journey. That's where it starts. And then out of that comes a flow that influences everything around us. Now, we are not called to live at church. We are called to live as the church. That's a very different approach, very different way to think. See, God isn't just trying to attract an audience. God is building participants. We're not going to a show and, and maybe our seats are good seats or bad seats, or maybe we're even backstage. That's not what God is doing. God is bringing us into the theater of operation, into the arena where we become active participants in what he is doing in the world. We all have a part to play. So God cannot work through you if you will not allow God to work in you. It starts inside. We have to engage in this internal journey. Now, the gospel of Luke ends with the disciples staying continually at the temple and praising God. That's a good thing. But something else needs to happen if they are going to be witnesses to the whole world. So just staying and praising in the temple is an incomplete assignment, according to Jesus. Something else needs to happen too. It's not saying that attending facilities and, and praising God and listening to scripture is not important, but it's not all there is to being the church. Something else has to happen. So God is about to make the most significant investment in human beings he's ever made. He's going to give greater authority than he's ever given. So the question is, who does God use? Who does God give these kinds of gifts to? And uh, we have some information in this opening chapter of Acts. We know that there are about 120 people that are present. That's a rough estimate. And we know that these were not just people who attended or saw the miracles of Jesus. That would have been many thousands. And it's not just people who had received a miracle because that would have been many hundreds. Jesus did many, many miracles. It's not just people who watched him. It's not just people who needed something from him. It was people who followed him. And these are 120 roughly people who have gathered together and they are waiting for promise. They don't just want to receive what God has, they want to release what God has. So here's the people that God uses. Number one, God uses people who know how to wait. God uses people who know how to wait. I don't like waiting. I know lots of people who don't like waiting. Um, disciples were told to wait for the promise. They were not told how long they had to wait. Was it 10 minutes? Was it 10 hours? Was it 10 days? Was it 10 weeks? It turns out it was 10 days, but they didn't know. Their assignment was just to wait. And here's the thing. If you're going to be used by God, your patience is going to be tested. That's just true. Um, we have a sense of internal timing, but that's often in conflict with God's sense of eternal timing. God has bigger agendas, bolder plans than the things that we have kind of calculated in our own hearts and minds. And he wants us to be able to move forward, but it has to be in his timing. And it's easy to make a mistake in timing. Um, if, if you ask a person to marry you before you should do it, you're likely to get a no. If you time that right, you're more likely to get a better response. Uh, sometimes when you apply for a job, when you show up to work, when you enter the market to purchase a home, all of those are timing issues. And, and we know just from natural things how important timing can be. How much more important in supernatural things, in spiritual things, is timing. And so we, our tendency is to bounce back and forth between two. I'm not ready yet to it's too late. These are the constant tension points that we feel. 
And we have to learn to wait. Wait on God. Submit, submit to what God wants and when God wants. And as it turns out, that second part can be even harder than the first part. Uh, the second thing that we know about the people that God uses is that God uses people who follow his word. God uses people who follow his word. Uh, if you read further on, we only went through uh, uh, verse 9. If you read on in the rest of the chapter of Acts, you discover that as they're waiting, uh, Peter recalls a passage from one of the Psalms. And in that passage, there seemed to be an indication that if there's an empty office, it needs to be filled. And if you know anything of the history of the Gospels, you know that Jesus was betrayed by a man named Judas, who was one of the 12, and he had actually uh, committed suicide. And so what we discover is, is that his position was kind of open, and, and they weren't really interested in doing anything about that until Peter recalled this psalm. And he said, maybe this is something we should give attention to. And so they established a kind of criteria in order to, as best they could, be obedient to their understanding of Scripture. And this is a really important thing. They were taking God's Word seriously. They're not just rounding up a number so they have an even number of apostles. What they're doing is they're rounding out a group of qualified leaders. They actually do believe that God is going to do something significant. And they had seen from Jesus himself how seriously he took leadership investment. And so they wanted to make sure that before anything happened, they had some leaders who were ready and willing to go at whatever direction God's spirit gave them. So they knew God was about to do something. They wanted to be ready. And this was actually something they could do while they waited. Now, when I say this, sometimes uh, people kind of get an image in their mind about some kind of legalistic approach to reading Scripture. And uh, uh, they, they start trying to, to look for these, these little things that somehow separate them from others. This isn't about legalism, and it certainly isn't about imposing guilt because somehow you didn't live up to a, a scriptural standard. It's about recognizing when there can be opportunity that there are times when we need to address something or adjust something because we've seen something in God's word. God uses people who follow his word. Submitting to God's word is a way of trusting. God calls us to that. If we are unable to submit to the written word of God, then it is highly unlikely that we will ever submit to the whispered word of God into our spirit about an action that we should take. This document that's been entrusted to us and handed to us, this document has gone through unbelievable scrutiny by people who held the very highest standards. And we can have a lot of confidence that what we see is what God intends us to have. This, this was not done overnight. This took hundreds of years. And so we, we can trust the authority of this book. But if we can't follow this, how are we ever going to follow a whisper prompting of God's Spirit to us? Uh, thirdly, God uses people who walk with Jesus. God uses people who walk with Jesus. It is true that God will go with you wherever you go. That even if you wander, if you get off track, if you get disoriented, if, if you kind of veer away, God doesn't abandon you. I do know there are some people in, 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 in Christianity who think that unless every single step is in complete, thorough obedience to the will of God, that somehow you separate yourself from God, or worse, he separates himself from you. That's not what Jesus said. He says, never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. So Jesus will go with us wherever we go. But there's a lot of wisdom in going where he goes. That's a very different way to think. There's a term that they use in scripture and the term is Lord. And that, that word Lord means I recognize you have authority to direct my life. I want to go where you go. 
So the question is, are you following Jesus? Or are you asking Jesus to follow you? Are you going where he wants you to go? Or are you asking him to bless what it is that you are doing? You see, there, I think there are things that Jesus wants to accomplish and things that Jesus wants to release and things that Jesus wants to redeem and things that Jesus wants to restore. And he has a path for us if we're willing to walk with him on it where all of those things can occur. So are you willing to follow Jesus? So we, we can attend a facility and we can repeat certain truths and, and there certainly is a value in doing that. But there's also value in not just being at church, but living as the church. So the question that I have for you is uh, this. Are you the kind of person who is willing to wait? Most people I know struggle with the patience component of life, not just faith. Are you the kind of person who's willing to follow scripture? That requires a kind of trust and a submitted heart, a kind of humility. that There may be better ways to do life than I have thought up. Are you the kind of person who's willing to walk with Jesus? If so, you're the kind of person that God can use to be the church. If there's anything our world needs right now, it's people who know how to be the church of the living God, expanding his kingdom, extending his truth and grace into every area of our culture and our life. So I'm going to ask you to think about this a little bit. Really, there's two things we need to learn to surrender. The first thing is the what. What am I going to do with my life? And what am I going to accomplish? And what is going to be on my agenda? And then there's the when. So <laughs> what is going to happen and when is it going to happen? And what I would encourage you to do today, now if you can, is just take a moment and lift both hands towards heaven, one representing the what and one representing the when, and just let God know, I'm the kind of person that will get on your agenda because I really do believe what you want for my life and our world exceeds my highest dreams or boldest expectations. And while you're in the act of surrender, just kind of turn your hands around and receive what it is that God has to offer. And this is what I know. I know that when we approach Jesus like that, that's, that's a way we lift Jesus up. And what I can tell you is when we see Jesus exalted in our life, the next thing that happens is the Spirit descends into our life. And so that's my prayer for you today. Heavenly Father, we lift our hands to you. We give to you the what of our life and the when of our life. And we receive everything you have to offer us. In the name of Jesus, amen.